Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure, and it's so nice to see so many people here. And I guess we've got a few folks joining online. I'm not sure how many, but welcome. Um, so today we have Associate <coughs> Professor um, Michael Wagner joining us from the Department of Geography at the University of Toronto, where he also holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Transportation and Health. Um, he also has a cross appointment in epidemiology at the Dalai Lama uh, School of Public Health, also at the University of Toronto. Um, I met Michael, I guess, nearly 10 years ago, I think, at a conference in 2013. So it's a particular pleasure for me to be able to welcome you here to Cambridge and uh, great to be able to twist your arm into giving a talk uh, while you're in town. Um, Michael is a health geographer, so very much uh, kind of close to my own heart and many of our interests, I think, touch on health geography. And today he's going to be talking about using time use and trajectory data to unpack the interrelated geographies of food, care, and household labour. So a warm welcome. Take it away. Great. Thanks. So I am going to be controlling two computers, uh, one on Zoom over there and one here. So I'm going to try to change the slides at the same time. Hopefully uh, this works OK. And then I'm going to just make this smaller so I don't see that. And then can everyone online see and hear me OK? I just want to make sure that's going OK. Yes, we can see and hear you very well. Perfect. All right, so thank you for the very kind introduction. Yes, it's been about 10 years. I think we're, we're getting on in age and uh, in seniority, I guess. So I, I feel like we were quite junior at that point and uh, now we're less junior. I, not, I wouldn't say we're senior at this point, but uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. We had the pleasure of hosting Tom in Toronto a few years back and uh, he shared some of the work you all were doing. And it's been uh, uh, great to, to sort of build more connections with you all. I, uh, a lot of the work done in this talk uh, was done in collaboration with Dr. Lindsay Smith, who will be joining as a uh, tenure track professor at University of Toronto in a few days, and uh, uh, Bo Chu Lu, who will soon be a, a doctor, uh, who's joining you all here at CEDAR. So it's great to sort of continue to build that relationship uh, between these two units. So uh, with that, I'll proceed. Um, so my entry point into this talk is really via my work on understanding how and when environments matter to health. And geographers have been examining these relationships for, for quite a while, now, for a few decades at this point. And the body of work really grew uh, quickly alongside a few uh, corresponding trends in research and technology. So GI systems became available, lots of spatial data became available, and that corresponded with this rise in researchers thinking, well, you know what, we need to start understanding, well, how the characteristics of our built environment are impacting uh, different types of health outcomes and health related behaviors. So a lot of this work has concentrated on uh, theories of access and exposure uh, with closer things having a positive or negative impact, depending on what they are. Uh, however, results in a few areas have been more inconsistent than others. Uh, so, for example, being more exposed to PM 2.5 or air pollution, uh, we kind of know that's bad, but that's that exposure relationship is a little bit more clear cut than, for example, uh, a relationship to exposure to a fast food outlet or a grocery store. Uh, the mechanisms at play are, are a bit more complex and nuanced, and that's led to some issues, I think. So linking those spatial uh, contexts to different types of outcomes in the food environment in particular um, has led to some inconsistent findings. And some of the issues are pretty easy to uh, sort of identify. So issues of spatial scope, certain studies look at entire regions, others look at, at small and uh, smaller scale neighborhoods. Uh, there are plenty of issues of statistical power. Many of the studies don't have large sample sizes, uh, issues in inconsistency on how data are collected, uh, how things are measured. And of course, a lot of studies tend to ignore some of the uh, non-modifiable uh, factors, so biologic and genetic factors that also influence uh, different types of outcomes related to uh, diet, but uh, also related to lots of other things. And so we, we're we doing all this great work, you know, we're in the environment and there's noise and alcohol and physical activity and food, uh, green space, um, but I think that it, it, we're at a point where we need to start thinking a little bit more carefully around how the mechanism between being exposed or within an environment is linked to a particular uh, type of behavior or outcome. 
Now, my interest in this area is really uh, predominantly in the area of food environments and understanding when and how food environments matter. Um, now, many of you are probably familiar with food environment research. Oh, wait, sorry, two slides. There we go. Um, uh, many of you are probably familiar with the uh, literature in the food environment uh, on food environments and its relationship to uh, health related behaviors and health. Um, but I think it's always worthwhile to take a step back and think a bit about the origin of this uh, body of work. Um, so there were pretty rapid shifts in urban geographies in the 20th century. Um, so the suburbanization of populations uh, in North America, there's uh, issues of white flight uh, where there are very racial trends in who was uh, sorting into different types of neighborhoods. Um, and sort of corresponding around the same time of some of these trends in the 80s and 90s, we also start to see the obesity epidemic, especially in the 90s, um, happening around the same time. Now, this also corresponds to the rise in GIS. So we see the three, these three things kind of coming together, uh, which, you know, geographers are looking around and saying, you know what, this might actually be a good time for us to step in and start doing some research. Uh, we can use this new tool to understand uh, how changes in the food environment might be related to this obesity epidemic and other um, issues related to diet and nutrition. And I think this is illustrated quite nicely uh, by a paper done by uh, Christian Larson and Jason Gilliland uh, in a study they did on uh, London, Ontario, the little London. Um, and they uh, mapped out where all the grocery stores were in 1961 um, and then again in 2005. And so this paper is quite old at this point, well, relatively old at this point, but I think it shows that trend quite nicely. You see in 1961 when, you know, the urban form of this city was relatively intact, people lived closer to downtown, uh, you know, the sort of suburbanization of that metropolitan area hadn't quite happened uh, to the effect that it eventually would. Um, we see a rather compact, good coverage of supermarkets and grocery stores but in 2005, the population really did move out of the city center and the grocery stores followed, right? There's a, a demand element and the supply will, will follow in these cases, leaving this gap, which then uh, sort of led to a lot of different uh, folks around uh, different countries starting to discuss things like food deserts. So the idea was that there's uh, uh, literally a deserted region within a city that has no access, no spatial access to these food retailers. Um, and so this was a rather appealing narrative because it actually was quite easy to explain to people in public health, to city governments. Um, however, it's not quite the whole story, I think. You know, this food desert thing really took off. Um, and for a good reason. The model was pretty simple. Two, two slides. Okay, I'm going to remember that. I have to do both here. Uh, the model was pretty simple. Uh, essentially, we have spatial access to food. So you have access to your grocery store that will influence your diet. And we know diet and health are related. So if you eat hamburgers all day and chips, um, you probably will have on average worse health outcomes than if you're eating lots of vegetables and fresh foods uh, that we know are healthy for you. Um, but this relationship is of course pretty complicated because access is very complex, right? There's the Pinchansky and Thomas paper from 1980 something where they go through the five A's of accessibility. Um, and also there's lots of other stuff influencing diet and health, right? So there's the non-modifiable factors, other mo non-spatial modifiable factors around health. Um, and then diet is a very complicated thing in and of itself. Um, and so this model, while quite appealing, um, is tied, I think, quite closely to that food desert work. And, and I, I kind of personally reject it. I mean, I've got this paper here, retiring the food desert, desert metaphor. Um, because I think it's no longer a useful way of thinking about food environments. So what are the complexities that we're thinking about in the diet uh, component of that model? Um, well, we need to think a bit more about how individuals actually interact with food outlets. So what are they doing? What drives them to a specific food outlet, whether it's fast food, whether it's a supermarket or a grocery store? Oh. Okay, sorry, Zoom, Zoom didn't get caught up there. I'm gonna, I, it's still going okay, Hannah. <laughs> um, all right, uh, apologies to the Zoom crowd for that. Um, so there are lots of complex interactions with who is buying what food and where. Uh, 
uh, whether it's a supermarket or a fast food retailer. So whether or not you have the money to purchase certain types of food, uh, do you have the transportation available to you to get to the store? Uh, and if you are using a bus instead of a car, perhaps you're buying more or less uh, from some outlet because you can carry more uh, in the trunk of your car. Uh, what tastes did you grow up with? What knowledge do you have? I mean, this is a lot of stuff that you all work with here at Cedar, right? Like you, you, you know this stuff. Um, what facilities are in your apartment or how house? Uh, what does your family look like? How much time do you have? And of course, there is this uh, spatial element too. So it's a necessary condition. Like you do need to be able to get to a store, but it's one of many different things. And so this is one of the reasons why that sort of more descriptive uh, type of analysis that we tend to see uh, of food environments, I think needs to be sort of phased out and we need to move more towards uh, a more complex representation of understanding food environments. Now, one area that I think has done quite a great job of incorporating some of those nuances and complexity uh, into quantitative analyses of of food, understanding how we interact with food uh, is that of the time use analysis uh, research arena. Uh, so there are researchers uh, like Carol Devine, uh, who's recently retired from uh, Cornell, uh, and Lizzie, Lindsay Smith Talley, uh, who has done some good work at the University of North Carolina, um, where they've really started to delve into how time spent on food activities is linked to health. Uh, well-being and roles within the household. And so they've taken a purely temporal approach to understanding uh, how we interact with food. Um, and we've done a little bit of this in the um, Toronto context. Uh, so I, I, this is another connection to the Cedar folks here where uh, a paper we wrote a, a year or two back now with uh, Lindsay uh, Smith, uh, Chloe As Asbury and uh, Tara Penny, who were all here at one point, uh, looked at how uh, time use on meal preparation was related to various health outcomes, self-reported health outcomes like mental health, uh, self-reported health and stress, uh, to understand how, uh, how that activity, a pretty important activity in the day, um, is corresponding to these different types of outcomes. And we found some interesting results. We found that the more time you spend on preparing uh, meals, uh, the, we see a reduction in stress. The more time you spend on preparing meals, we also saw an increase in self-reported mental health. We didn't see a relationship with self-reported health, but um, these two things I think are an interesting first dive into some of the, uh, this area that we could really kind of do a bit more with. Uh, now, that, that sort of general relationship to total time spent on meal preparation is interesting, but I think what was more interesting to me in this paper was that we saw very significant differences in the activity sequences when we stratified uh, our sample by uh, health and time use variables. So we essentially took this big time use survey that was collected across Canada, about 18,000 observations, and we separated the sample into, it was a weighted sample, separated it into people who had lower self-reported health and higher self-reported health. And you probably can't see this table very well, but I'll just kind of describe what's happening. Um, essentially, what we see is that people with very good self-rated health, for example, had different distributions uh, of activities, two activities prior to, one activity prior to, one activity after, and two activities after the actual activity of meal preparation. Did that make sense? So basically, people who are saying they have better health are doing different types of things before and after. Uh, they're actually doing this important activity of meal preparation, which we know is linked to preparing more healthy outcome or out, excuse me, more healthy meals, uh, which we know are related to uh, better nutrition and diet. So that was interesting to me because essentially each of these activities has its own geography. And so this wasn't a spatial analysis, but I was intrigued by this idea of starting to think more about, well, if each of these activities has a geography, how do those different geographies potentially influence the ability for somebody to engage in something else prior to or after an important activity like meal preparation? So for example, if you are a single parent working two jobs and you live next door to a low cost supermarket, um, you may not have time to prepare food because the geographies that are required of you to go to other positions within your city 
could influence your ability to engage in those healthy behaviors that have those downstream effects on nutrition and, and eventually health. So that's sort of some of the motivation uh, behind some of the work I'll be presenting uh, going forward. Now, that kind of leads me to this idea that uh, basically starting with my dissertation, uh, I, I've been really interested in unpacking the links between geography and, um, and food and health by incorporating time. So using time as a, as a way to sort of extract um, some of the nuances, some of those complexities that I've been harping on for the last couple of minutes here. And the basic idea is that that person's time is, is inextricably linked uh, to their geography. So those two things can't be uh, uh, separated. And so for food related activities, there are certain temporal patterns and scales that matter. So what are those scales? What are the patterns that are important? What are the sequences that are important? So can we disentangle the impacts of space and time on diet and health. So we've seen uh, some good advancement in this area and especially in ways to collect and analyze spatiotemporal data. Um, and I think it's leading to some new opportunities uh, in the realm of uh, understanding food environments in particular. Okay, so uh, now one thing I always tell my students uh, at Toronto and, and uh, probably other people that don't really want me to talk to them about this stuff is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? So if there are theories and methods and approaches that already exist, we should be using them. And so there's sort of a deep cut theory in geography. How many geographers are in the room? Any besides Tom? Okay. Okay. So this is a deep cut theory. It's like a really hip indie theory in geography, time geography. How many people know about time geography? Not many. Okay. So a bunch of Swedes uh, in the 70s and 60s got together and they started doing some really cool work on understanding space and time. Uh, a guy named uh, uh, Hagerstrand. That's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, a few others, Kasha Elgard and uh, Bo Lentorp, all were doing some really interesting work um, in trying to understand not just sort of aggregate time use, but also the sort of disaggregated sequences of time and their relationships to particular spaces. Um, and so this is stuff from literally the 50s and 60s. You've got to go back in Google Scholar and sort of look at more distant literature. Um, and the aim of this area was to demonstrate the, dy the dynamism and changeability of everything with a focus on the material, which is what Bo Lentorp said. Um, and this is a really great toolkit for us to perhaps use in unpacking some of the relationships we have with food environments in space and time. So it's a focus on flows across space and context, not the means and aggregates, which I think gives us a really cool opportunity uh, in this space. So in time geography, there's sort of four primary components. There's, uh, this is laid out in this paper by Bo, Bo Lentorp from 2004. Um, there are trajectories and prisms, and you may be, probably most of you are familiar with trajectories uh, from using GPS. And trajectories are continuous, indivisible, and positively directed along temporal dimensions. Uh, so these are your GPS traces, basically. And there are prisms. So these complement trajectories. What they do is sort of show the potential. If you're in some space, what other spaces could you possibly go to? So what are the opportunities for you to go to a supermarket, for example, if you're at the biomedical campus here at Cambridge versus if you were in the city center. So that changes some of the constraints that you might be working with. So as just to, to a way to illustrate these first two areas of time geography, uh, we have trajectory. So this is a, a study we did in 2018, looking at different types of food behaviors of young adults in Canada with uh, Dave Hammond and a few other authors from the Canada Food Study, which became the IFPS. Um, and they had sort of just happened to collect some GPS data uh, and we had a food diary and we were able to sort of see when people were purchasing food, when they were exposed to different opportunities. And so here we have a trajectory in the upper right hand corner uh, and those uh, the colored map behind it shows how much time they're spending in these different spaces and the three dimensional image shows the intensity of time spent in areas. So in this paper, what we thought was, well, maybe we can see how the dose of exposure is really impacting the different types of use and uh, uh, different perceptions around uh, food. Uh, these different dots here are also different 
food types of food stores. So grocery stores, fast food outlets, convenience stores, for example. So this is a trajectory and trajectories are great. Um, we use them a lot. Uh, I think you all use them a lot. They're all over the food environment literature these days, uh, but they have plenty of limitations. Uh, there is the issue of the select mobility bias, which we spoke a bit about at the IMGS, where we didn't really figure anything out. But I think you all have a data set we could potentially make some headway on that with. Uh, it can be costly. Um, it can be quite prohibitive uh, if you want to compensate your participants uh, at a level that they probably need to be compensated because it's a pretty burdensome type of data collection. There are reliability issues. And I think most importantly, from my perspective, it's devoid of context. So this is uh, uh, me uh, in Toronto, downtown Toronto. And, um, you know, if you could tell me what, this was from 2017 or something like that. I don't know what I was doing this day. And if you could tell me what I was doing this day, that would be good. You could probably figure out, you know, like maybe I live around here, which is true. Actually, no, I live up here. Um, and then maybe I work here, which is also true. And I don't know, maybe I did a run or something. But, you know, what actually happened with, this day is, is impossible to really figure out. So uh, we can get exposures, but we can't really understand, you know, why, why did I go here? Why did I go here? Maybe I went to buy a donut or maybe I went to buy a, I don't know, a, a, a cabbage. Like nobody could tell you, right? I couldn't tell you what I was doing that day. Um, so that context, the lack of context with trajectories is, is an issue. Now with prisms, uh, there's a bit more potential here, and we've worked a little bit with prisms. So prisms essentially allow you to look at where a person is and then maybe where they need to go. So perhaps you all work here and you live, I assume, somewhere within the region. Um, and so you have an origin and a destination. You have, two de you have two anchor points. And between those two anchor points, there's a world of possibilities. You could get up and walk out of my talk right now and go to the supermarket uh, or not, right? Or you could do it later, but depending on when you decide to leave, there's different opportunities. How fast you can go, uh, uh, you know, will determine how many of those possibilities you have. There are coupling constraints. So interactions with additional agents. So this is a really big part of the time geography theory. So if you have a, a partner or a child, like that will affect what you're able to do. Authority constraints, so speed limits, um, you know, uh, cultural limits and, and where or when you're supposed to go to certain places. So the PRISMS uh, concept allows us to incorporate some of the context into, into trajectories, for example. And we did do a little bit of work in this area in, when I was at the University of Cincinnati looking at, uh, well, if, instead of looking at home access, what if we looked at uh, access to supermarkets, uh, considering the commute. So looking when you're at home or when you're at work. And this is in fact how I think Tom and I essentially kind of met. He did a similar study around the same time uh, where we just wanted to understand, well, if you live here, if you live at this uh, point in the center of the, the uh, plane that says space on it, then your access to food stores is represented by this circle right here. But if you work here and live here and you have a commute between these two spaces, your exposure, your access actually changes into this oval. And so we're able to conceptualize access a little differently. Um, and so we use this prism approach uh, to understand what's potentially available uh, if you drove. Uh, but we did a bit more of a complex uh, analysis by looking at transit patterns, too. So look at transit commuters and you can see little mini uh, prisms within the bigger prisms here. And those are bus stops, right? So like you can't just get out of the bus. You have to wait till there's a stop and then there's some amount of time you have till there's the next uh, option to keep going. So we were able to sort of look at the differences between auto drivers and transit users. Uh, and we actually found quite a different patterning of where people did or did not have access to, to supermarkets in the city. Uh, so these uh, uh, dark regions are, are low um, uh, access to, to uh, supermarkets in the city of Cincinnati. The red zones are uh, the quote unquote food desert zones the uh, US Department of Agricultural uh, Economics Research Bureau put together. And so the map doesn't quite correspond when we start to incorporate uh, that movement. So these are both uh, like kind of leading us to context or leading us to a more complicated way of, of thinking about 
food environments, but they're still kind of naive approaches. And we're only really thinking about space and exposure and access at this point. I think really where the field needs to be moving is towards the geography of behaviors. Um, so what theories of time geography uh, are there that could help us here? Um, so the last two uh, parts of time geography are really, I think, where we can gain a lot from what we try to do in the FAST study, which I'll introduce shortly. Uh, so there are two things that basically nobody has done much work on uh, because they're kind of a pain in the butt to use. Uh, they're complicated. They're a little esoteric. Uh, but I think we're getting to a point where we can start to um, incorporate these ideas a bit more formally into empirical studies on food research. So the first is this idea of pockets of local order. So the idea that most activities required to find sections of space and time with different agents coming together at one place. So if you go to the supermarket and it's closed, you don't have access to the supermarket. So that's kind of the basic idea. You need things to come together um, in a social structure. Um, then there are projects. Um, projects is, I think, a really has a lot of potential in this area. Projects are essentially saying activities require sequenced processes and pockets of local order to execute with the constraints that we talked about with um, the prisms there. And an, and an example of a project could be eating a healthy meal. So in order to eat a healthy meal, you don't just sit down at your table and eat you know, a healthy meal. You have to travel to the food store, buy ingredients, travel home, prepare the food, cook food, serve food, eat the meal, clean up. Um, and so that would be an example of a project. Each of these things has some geography tied to it. And if you don't do the things prior to or afterwards, it's not really possible to do the thing we're most interested in, which is actually eating a healthy meal. Now you can scale this in lots of different ways. So for example, we could do a project about being healthy in which eating a healthy meal could be a sub project and it could get really complicated really fast, which is why people basically haven't done much with this stuff. So we were um, perhaps uh, overly ambitious and decided to try and we had some mixed success, but I will kind of get into how we did uh, in our analysis using these theories of time geography. Uh, through the Food Activity Socioeconomics Transportation Time Use Study, so the FAST study. And the idea here was to try to incorporate both a time use diary and trajectory data to sort of contextualize the movements. So we'd have the trajectories and the movements over space and time with some self-reported behavior. People would tell us what they were doing and why they were doing certain things, who they were with, and so on and so forth. And we could start to unpack some of the complexities that I've been rambling on about here. So we could look at divisions of household labor, time stress and dietary behavior, spatial variations and time use, and so on. So in this study, we focused on uh, three neighborhoods with similar demographics. Uh, both, all of them were sort of medium low income neighborhoods in the city of Toronto. So downtown Toronto is here where the subway sort of intersects with all the streetcar routes. Um, one of the neighborhoods was South Parkdale, which is a relatively transit-rich, dense, walkable neighborhood. Uh, and then another of the neighborhoods was North Rexdale, which is kind of out near the airport. It's very suburban, uh, has low access to trans transit. Um, uh, there's not, uh, the food environment is, has lots of fast food, fewer options for supermarkets and so on. We also tried to recruit in a area called West Hill, where there were, there were lots of food opportunities, lots of supermarkets, but uh, not very good transit. So a suburban environment where there are plenty of low and sort of medium cost uh, grocery stores. Uh, we basically struck out there uh, in part because in these two neighborhoods, we had community partners going in and we just weren't able to make a connection in West Hill that allowed us to really get into the neighborhood uh, and work with the, the folks that were there. So. North Rexdale, we have a standing sort of relationship with working uh, with their community hub and the same in Parkdale, uh, which has gone on beyond the study, but uh, West Hill kind of fell apart, unfortunately. So notes on the sample, I'm not going to show you that um, table because uh, it's just, you can look at the papers, but I think I, I want to just start off by saying that the sample was not representative. We did, what we were trying to do was to focus on households with multiple adults with kids. Uh, and by chance, the entire sample only contains heterosexual couples. So the sample, what we aim to do was get time use data uh, 
and uh, GPS data from all adults within a household. So not only would we see, you know, one individual in the household, we would see two or three if there's like a grandparent, for example, and we could see how they interact in coordinating meals, coordinating different types of food activities. Um, we saw a higher completion rate in Rexdale. Um, participants in Parkdale have a slightly higher income, and uh, by by not by design, but the majority of our participants identified as South Asian. Uh, and this is related to the sampling. We had a snowball sampling method that I think really took off um, with the South Asian community in both of these um, uh, two communities. It wasn't expected in Parkdale. Rexdale has a relatively high South Asian community. And so uh, again, it's a relatively small end. So this is more of a, a pilot, I guess, if you will. I, I would just say, hopefully the ideas of how we approach this are interesting, uh, though keep a, a, keep a, a bit of a, a wary eye towards some of the, the outcomes. Unfortunately, we can't say too much about uh, how good these outcomes are given our models. So, so like I said, uh, we collected GPS data and uh, time use uh, diaries uh, for seven days. Um, we also collected a dietary questionnaire and we had a main survey they completed during an orientation uh, where we told them more about the survey and provided some compensation to the participants. Uh, di different data on socioeconomic status, diet, health, um, transportation, and so on. Now, what did these things look like? So the time use di di diary was based off of the Harmonized European uh, Time Use Survey, uh, which collects information uh, every 10 minutes. Uh, but you don't write down every 10 minutes what you're doing. You sort of, it's a, uh, a, a reflective survey where during lunch and at the end of the day, we asked them to fill out what they were doing. Um, and they would say, you know, I woke up, uh, got dressed, uh, had breakfast. And then I, this is a, a pilot data from one of the RAs who permitted me to use it. Um, they went for writing. Maybe this is, they're just doing this to, you know, sort of show that they were writing to me, but um, they don't have to write writing group for the entire 10 minute period. They just draw an arrow down until they do the next thing. Um, over here, they can say where things were happening. They were, at, they were bicycling during their trip to campus. Then they were at the university. Who were they with? They could write down if they were with somebody else uh, in the survey. And then we can take that, digitize it uh, into something that looks like this, into a sequence. So in this case, uh, we have two participants, which I'll get back to them later. Uh, and categorize the ways there are the things that uh, people wrote down. And we use the Statistics Canada categorizations of time use to do this. And we can kind of compare different trends and sequences uh, in uh, time use. Now, you've probably seen this stuff before, but here are the trajectory data. This is just sort of a big blob of everyone's trajectory data. But you can see the concentration in Parkdale and Rexdale um, here in Toronto. Um, and this is also collected during the same period of time. So we're able to then sort of merge these things together and sort of relate how the time use information and the GPS data are, are related to each other. So this paper, uh, you know, I'm gonna just go over three uh, papers that have been published recently in this, uh, from this study. Um, the first two are related to how this type of data and this type of approach uh, can allow us to uncover things around household geographies and the division of labor, which is very important when it comes to understanding food behaviors in a household. So um, the study design allows for those insights because we collected multiple adults. We didn't collect any uh, data on children, but we are making the assumption that the majority of food uh, behavior is, is being driven by the adults in the household. Um, so in this case, this is that sequence I showed before. This is uh, two of our participants. This is a, a husband and wife. Um, and you can see the different types of activities. We have work. We have transportation. Uh, I mean, we can have child care and uh, chores, which is represented by green. And you can see the coordination, right? So in the morning, uh, it looks like the, this is the husband and this is the wife in this case. The husband is doing child care and chores. And in the evening and in the middle of the night, the wife is getting up and doing likely childcare in this case. And so we can see the coordination. We can also see the gender roles, the sort of uh, gender dynamics at play uh, in this data set. Um, and then we can express that spatially. So we can look at that same uh, couple and look at how those things actually are represented across space and time. So we were able to take the trajectory data and evaluate exposures uh, look at, you know, what they were exposed to at different time periods, 
and see uh, how you know outcomes might differ based on on those relationships. So this first paper that was led by Dr. Smith asks, what are the implications of using trajectory data of only one household member to calculate exposure scores if the task is or can be completed by multiple household members? So this is an area I think the food environment has really missed, is that, that buying food is not an individual activity in many cases, right? Especially for families. Um, there may be one person that takes on most of the responsibility. There may be multiple people. But, you know, there's coordination. Um, and if you're just missing one person, if you're only, sorry, evaluating one person, you may be missing a lot of the story. And so given our sort of issues with the sample, we thought, well, what is something we can do? We can do a proof of concept by showing what happens if you only look at one person in a household versus both people in a household. Um, so what happens if they're missing? And then who's actually doing the shopping? Who actually has the different exposures? And so what we see, um, oh, this graphic got a little bit messed up, but I think you can still kind of make it out. Um, so what we see is essentially there are three possibilities in our analysis. There's one adult with one respondent. So the household that just has one adult uh, in the household, their activity path may like look like this and they would have exposures that are along those lines. Um, in B, you might have two adults, but if you only capture one person, then you still have that representation of the one adult, but you have no idea what the person in gray is doing. So their exposures, their activities might actually be very important. They might be the one buying all the food, cooking, uh, for example. Um, and then C, we've got uh, data on both adults in a household with two or more respondents. And we can see how those patterns might complement each other um, or not. Um, and so we can calculate accessibility measures for uh, both adults and then merge them. So we might have individual level access for uh, adult or, par or partner one and partner two, and then we can merge them to generate a household level access measure for those um, for that particular household to see what that looks like. You know, is it how gendered is it? Uh, what are the exposures? What are the extents of these different uh, uh, paths, etc.? So I'm, I'm not going to go too into the actual. Analysis, I'll point you to the paper. It's in the Annals of uh, the Association of American Geographers, uh, led by Dr. Smith, as I said. But essentially, you know, as you could imagine, leaving out an individual in a household with multiple shoppers results in missing a significant number of exposures. So if you don't account for both of the uh, parents in this case, uh, you're missing a lot of information. Um, we saw men appeared to make up most of the household activity space areas, so they were going further and actually being exposed to more stuff in general, um, often driven by commutes in, in our case. Um, but uh, women's activity spaces typically have greater retail, food retail density. So we actually see that though they have smaller spaces uh, in our sample, which is small, uh, we saw this especially for supermarkets. Uh, so we sort of see the uh, a gender dynamic within our sample. Now, comparing men and women in the same household, the density of supermarkets are greater for women across all the different measures we did. So we looked at relative density, we looked at total density, we did all sorts of different types of uh, uh, sensitivity analysis on exposure, uh, and the same thing came out across uh, all of our analyses. So the next paper, which I'll just present one slide on uh, was recently uh, published in the journal Time and Society, it was led by um, soon to be Dr. Liu uh, Bochu, uh, where we took the data from our survey and looked at the time use logs for uh, coupled opposite gender, sorry, uh, opposite gender couples, and wanted to see essentially how the behaviors of one partner in our sample affected uh, the behavior of the other partner. Um, and so what we did is we, we looked at um, essentially when food activities occurred and what was happening in their partner's uh, time use log. Um, and what we saw was that both male and female partners took a higher proportion of food work when their partner worked longer. So if um, my partner was working longer, then I would take a greater share of actually doing meal preparation, food shopping. But we did see gender differences in the responsiveness to change or changes in partners' time spent on non-food related tasks. So uh, women responsible for food were responsible for food work even with increased caregiving responsibilities, while men do less food work when they did not did additional non-food related household activities. So essentially, the sort of gist of it is that 
men, even if their partner was doing more, they would do less of more than the women if the men were doing more. So the responsiveness, so the elasticity of that um, type of behavior was different based on the gender in our sample. So again, uh, we had a small sample. Uh, we did look at environmental covariates, but there weren't any um, differences found across our suburban and our urban neighborhoods and different levels of exposure. But that, I think, elasticity in how those uh, behaviors play out, I think, is an interesting finding in and of itself. Okay, so then the last paper I will go over from this study is actually merging these uh, two pieces of information. This is sort of the very, this when we, when I set out to write this uh, grant proposal uh, and get funding for this project. This was like, the, this was the thing I really wanted us to do. Um, and Bochu uh, led this project. Uh, he did an excellent job on it. Um, and the question was, how does time use affect food related behaviors and how do built environments impact time use? So trying to square the circle, here. how do we find that feedback relationship between these things? So can we link time use diaries with trajectory data to identify the common patterns across the two dimensions? Um, now, we were thinking, we were racking our brain, like, how do we actually do this? Um, and we came across uh, some literature from bioinformatics. So we decided to borrow from the smart folks over in uh, the bioinformatics department who are using uh, multi-channel channel optimal matching of activity categories uh, on DNA sequences. So they use this a lot in the study of genetics, DNA. Um, and we thought, well, we could probably use that same method and apply it in a geographic setting where our sequences are no longer DNA, but instead they're sequences of behaviors, sequences of locations. Um, and so we're able to sort of find patterns. So analyze the sequences and compare them across our participants um, and then cluster them together to see how uh, different type of types of participants are grouped. So we can understand the different ways that maybe people who work at night are actually having their behavior play out than people who work during the day or who don't work at all. So here's just a representation of the data set again, the GPS data over here on the right and the time use data on the left. And so what we did was the time use data was already in a sequence. So that was relatively easy to deal with. So that was one of the dimensions taken care of, but we needed to turn the GPS data into a sequence as well. Um, so to do this, uh, what we did was, um, take our sequence of activities of interest. So we simplify them into work, caregiving, and food-related chores, non-food related chores, and other activities. And then we started to segment our space-time trajectory patterns uh, into these sort of location indicators. So essentially, we over time looked at where a person was, how far away from home they were, and created categories. So in this case, we have a sequence of distance-based locational indicators. So basically, were they at home? Were they in their neighborhood? Or were they beyond their neighborhood? Uh, and we created a sequence derived from the GPS data. And then with D here, that's the sequence of context locational indicators. So were they exposed to a supermarket or not during these different time periods? Um, and then we added these together to create a composite sequence. So we created this composite sequence here. Now, this is just a relatively simple example of what you could do. You could actually create much more complicated representations of geography. And I think that actually is probably in order, but for our sake or our case, um, in the sake of being parsimonious, uh, we, we just stuck to these two things. So are you at home or are you not at home? Um, are you near food retail or are you not food at near food retail? And then we can use this as another sequence in our analysis. Now, um, I'm going to let Bochu explain all this to you. Uh, so make sure you ask him when he's here. But I can explain the basics of it. Essentially, what we did is we compared the distances between sequences. So if you have two sequences, so A, B, C, and A, B, C, so person one's A, B, C, and person two's A, B, C, uh, the distance would be zero because they're exactly the same. But if I was, person one was ABC and person two was ABB, there'd be a substitution cost of one because that last part of the sequence is a B instead of a C. And so you'd have to substitute it and the cost would be one. You can assign different costs. There's all sorts of ways you can parameterize this, but essentially 
Uh, that's how this works. It's a, we did it across these longer sequences across two dimensions. Um, and there's a, a, a library in R called uh, Treminer that allows you to, to do this. So what did we end up finding? So uh, essentially we ended up with six clusters. Uh, we did the analysis at the week level and at the day level. Um, this is a kind of, this is the sort of raw information uh, with sort of uh, anecdotal titles that we assigned to each of these groups. Uh, looking at it as uh, distribution is probably a little bit easier to, to take in. Um, and it's kind of hard to see on this screen. Uh, so I'm just going to zoom in to the, this is the day, or this is the day, this is one day of uh, time. Uh, and we can see the activities and the locational indicators and the distribution of what people are doing and how the clusters were generated. So in the daily pattern one, these are people who work during the day, so that dark gray is working uh, with no out-of-home exposure. So this brown is like there's no exposure to food retail, um, basically uh, outside, of their, um, outside of their neighborhood. Uh, we have daytime workers with no exposure at all. Um, so we are able to sort of separate the people who work during the day who do have exposure and don't have exposure. Uh, we have non-working days with no exposure. We have days with evening work. We have non-working days with exposure around the home and then daytime working with exposure around the home, but not work. Um, so these categorizations then allow us to sort of assign these archetypes to our participants, which we can then relate to the survey data we collected um, or other information like the number of times they, they, or how long they spent cooking a meal, for example. So these clusters give us a way to sort of characterize our participants. Uh, I apologize for the zoom. I just, this is the second uh, set of uh, daytime descriptions. So just to keep the um, uh, results relatively simple, we found some, some significant results. Again, take all this with a grain of salt because of our sample. Uh, we did see less paid work means uh, more food-related chores. So people who uh, stay at home are doing more of the food-related work. Uh, evening workers generally spent less time on food chores and shopping, which corresponds to some of the literature on, on shift work. Uh, workers with food retail access near home showed more food shopping activities, which links back a little to what Lindsay found around the gendered patterns of activity spaces. Um, and those activity spaces close to home were linked to more food shopping. So again, linking back to Lindsay's paper. So like I said, the sample was small, uh, but I think this showed, shows that proof of concept of how we can link these two things together. Now, I'll just end well, not end, but I'll just give one more sort of quick uh, a plug for a paper that Fochi is working on. Well, he's finished. It's out for review. Um, and this is actually getting into that project idea, which I, I looked at earlier. And we, we were trying to think of an empirical way that we could test some of the stuff that we were dealing with. But we decided to go with a more of a, a sort of qualitative, quantitative approach because the, the end was just not there. And what we did was we started to look at the sequences of uh, time use for partners and look at the sort of the narratives of their days to see how they they took place uh, and how their partners day took place and what those two things might say about space and place and very social science and geographic things that we were looking at. And so this is work underway, uh, but I hope that that's something we can share uh, in the near future. And Bocha will be here now so he can tell you when it's out. So for my last slide here, um, I think this all is well and good, but you know there are limitations to the approach that we took. Um, you know, I was complaining about the lack of context and behavior uh, early on, and I think we achieved that to some degree uh, in our approach and in our study. But uh, we also came up against other limitations, particularly small samples. Right? We had really small samples, unrepresented samples. It was really hard to get people to agree to do seven days of time use diaries and seven days of GPS. Um, there are other ways to do this with, uh, um, I'm just blanking on it, the EMAs, what is the, what's the, uh, yes, thank you, e ecological momentary assessments. Like there's other ways to kind of un like get at some of this stuff, but I think having that complete information, actually there's a real benefit to that that isn't really captured by an EMA approach. So, you know, I think that there is the potential, but the data collection challenges still exist. And um, 
you know, we compensated our participants relatively well, but that won't scale. We can't really pay, uh, you know, 10,000 people the amount we paid to participate in this study. We just would never get a funder to agree to it. So I think that, you know, while that this approach, I think, has a lot of promise, uh, it does get away from the simplistic approach that we've been taking now, uh, and that there are opportunities from time geography and that we can incorporate into the quantitative health research domain um, in areas like physical activity, for example, mental health, uh, care and caring in particular. Um, I do think that we are at a point where we need to start thinking, what are the feasible ways that we can collect information like this uh, to, to say something statistically meaningful so that we can add to the evidence base uh, in a way that is less anecdotal than what we see in this, this presentation. So I think one area we, we could go a little bit further if we can't expand the sample size very easily is uh, incorporating more mixed methods. Um, so this is a, a great area where we, one thing I wish we would have done in this project was also set up interviews. And we didn't do that at the beginning of the study. And it's not possible for us to go back because of our protocol now. And I think that would have really helped link some of the um, things we observed in the time use data uh, and really uncovered more about the motivation, right? So we're able to get a little bit closer to motivation, but you know, sometimes the best way to get at motivation is to ask, why did you do that? Um, and so an interview approach complementing something like this could be a real benefit at sort of a smaller scale uh, if you can't really scale up the uh, data collection. So I've been thinking about what's next. I've been talking to Tom about what's next. That's my dog. He's he just always thinks about what's next. Yeah. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to present some of the stuff that we've been going over now. I again want to thank uh, almost uh, Professor Lindsay Smith and almost Dr. Bochulu um, for their uh, help on all this. And of course, the the, the funders for the, this work. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time. Um, and I think I'll stop there. All right. Thank you for your attention.